Good afternoon. My name is Tom Beaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of each month. A detailed schedule of the series, as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services, can be found at our website, www.nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Falls City native John Falter rose to become one of the most successful American illustrators from the 1930s through the 1960s. His artwork provided numerous covers and illustrations for articles and advertisements in mainland magazines such as Good Housekeeping, McCall's, and the Saturday Evening Post. Collections Division Associate Director Deb Arns <coughs> will discuss the life and times of this famous American artist. Her talk today is The Illustrated, Illustrator's Pencil, John Falter from Nebraska, to the Saturday Evening Post. Yes. Deb? Hello, thank you all for coming. Um, as uh, Tom mentioned, um, my, the name of my talk is The Illustrator's Pencil, John Falter from Nebraska to the Saturday Evening Post, which is also the title of the exhibit on the third floor of this museum about John Falter. So how many of you have seen the exhibit? Yay, okay. And then the rest of you can go after this, right? <laughs> and I was also told that I needed to ask, how many of you are from Falls City? Oh, that's a good, good. Okay, so every time I say Falls City, you take a drink of your pop, and it'll be like our own little drinking game. Because I probably mention it a lot. <laughs> okay, so again, the exhibit upstairs basically tells the story of John Falter's life and career from his childhood in Nebraska to his years illustrating covers for the Saturday Evening Post. And since I think we did a pretty good job in that exhibit, I'm not going to really reinvent the wheel here. I'll be following the same basic outline of the exhibit, but I've tried to find additional items and tidbits of information to share with you that will give you a greater understanding of Falter. Um, I think this program and the exhibit work best in tandem, so again, I strongly encourage you to visit the exhibit if you haven't seen it already. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Falter, he was born and raised in Nebraska and gained prominence as one of the most successful illustrators from the 1930s through the 1960s. He illustrated ad campaigns for companies such as Pall Mall, General Motors, Packard, Aero Shirts, and Schlitz Beer, just to, me, to just name a few. He was also, perhaps most notably, one of the most prolific of the Saturday Evening Post cover artists. And in my figuring, I've sort of looked at some of the other um, prominent artists who, who illustrated for the Post for their covers, and I think John actually falls in at about third behind Norman Rockwell and uh, Lion Decker. So he did 129 covers in about 20 years. So many of the exhibits in the uh, many of the items in the exhibit upstairs, as well as a lot of the pie pieces featured in this program, were from Falter's studio. The contents of which were donated to the NSHS by his widow, Mary Elizabeth Falter Jones, shortly after his death in 1982. It's a large, over 5,000 pieces collection. It's truly spectacular, and I think it gives us a real glimpse into John Falter's life, his career, and his creative process. And I think that the collection here at the Society is a real Nebraska gem. So we will start at the beginning. John Falter was born in Plattsmouth, Nebraska in 1910 to a close-knit artistic family. In fact, he had a pair of aunts who traveled the country as the Nebraska or Nebraska sisters. They were a musical act. And actually, one of his aunts even was in the silent movies. So they were a very artistic clan. And this here is a photo of John at about the age of three or four. He's on the right, obviously. And these are his parents, George and Margaret. Falter's, Falter's father worked in clothing retail, and this is an, an item from our collection. It's the interior photo of F Falter and Theroff from Plattsmouth. And on the back, John F 
Falter wrote, this was Dad's first place of business in Plattsmouth, Nebraska. By 1916, though, Falter's father had moved their family to Falls City, where he opened Falter's clothing store. And he, John spent the rest of his childhood in Falls City. So I've said it, what, three times now? And Plattsmouth once. <laughs> uh, John had an innate artistic gift, which was very encouraged at home. And by the time he was a teenager, he developed a strong interest in drawing, cartooning, and in jazz music. He became, actually, he became a self-taught, an accomplished self-taught jazz clarinetist and pianist. Um, and the theme of jazz would surface in his work various times throughout his career. He was also influenced by many of the popular cartoonists and illustrators of the day, including James Montgomery Flagg. And actually, this image on the top image is one by Flagg, and the image on the right is one that John did when he was about 16, where he was trying to capture and master flag sort of distinctive hatching technique. These are two more examples of Falter's teenage sketches. There's a stylized flapper and two cavemen. The cavemen are actually drawn on the back of Falter clothing store letterhead. And Falter was quoted as saying that when he was a teenager, he was supposed to go to the clothing store to help run the business, but really what he'd do is take off and sketch all day. So we have quite a few sketches in our collection from when he was a teenager, and many of which are on Falter clothing store letterhead. And while John was very encouraged in his artistic pursuits by his family, he was also um, encouraged by people in the community. These are, this is actually from his high, sc his high school annual in Fall City. He drew that illustration there where it says senior, and then I put a red arrow there Underneath his drawing, you can see that Falter Clothing Store also supported their annual, the orange and black. I think he did illustrations for each year that he was in high school. The larger community also acknowledged John's talent. And in May of 1926, again when he was 16, the Fall City Journal began running his cartoon down through the ages. It only ran for a couple of months, but it was a start and really quite an accomplishment for a teenager. The concept of these um, cartoons are basically sort of showing how, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So he would draw something on the top that was old-timey and then have a modern equivalent that was basically fulfilling the same purpose. Um, he was tinkering, he continued to tinker with the down through the ages theme and cartoon strip while he was in art school. The one on the bottom right which is titled, comparatively speaking, is one that he did sometime between 1928 and 1930, probably when he was in art school. Um, this, however, is as far as his cartooning career went, fortunately for the rest of the world, since he became an illustrator. After his high school graduation in 1928, Falter and his father went to visit syndicated cartoonist Ding Darling at the Des Moines Register for advice on a career in cartooning. Looking at Falter's work, Darling suggested that he become an illustrator instead, and he attend the Kansas City Art Institute. Falter took the advice to heart, and he enrolled there. His family followed him, and eventually they ended up relocating in Atchison, Kansas. The images here were done while he was attending the Kansas City Art Institute. And you can tell that Falter's trying out different techniques and styles and sort of you know, figuring out what was going to be his own. And a note on the back of the image to the right indicates that this was a, a sample that he did from a movie still of Greta Garbo. Mm -hmm. um, while at the Kansas City Art Institute, John learned the fundamental point of illustration, which is to de depict action from the text and convey that action and the meaning instantly to the viewer. He also learned to use models and props to set his scenes as opposed to relying strictly on photographs, which Many artists believed if you relied solely on photographs, your illustrations would end up looking sort of flat and lifeless like a photograph. Um, but throughout his career, Falter used both stage scenes and photography for his work. He would have his models pose using props and clothing that were appropriate to the desired outcome and then photograph them for future reference. Many times the faces in his illustrations and sometimes even the sexes of the individuals of the, mo of the models would be changed in the finished piece. And I'll show you that in a later slide. 
Um, so while he was at the Kansas City Art Institute, Falter applied for and received a scholarship to the Art Students League of New York, where illustrators like Norman Rockwell and again Flagg had studied. He left for New York City in 1929. He only remained at the Art Students League for a short period of time and then transferred to the Grand Central Art School. He was very ambitious, though, and after one semester at Grand Central, he decided he wanted to try, try to start working for the magazines. And this photo is actually of John during his first week in New York City. And so that's probably why he looks a little bit be befuddled. <laughs> False city boy in New York. Here's a few more pieces from his art school days. The Lone Cowboy was finished while he was at the Art Students League, and the couple was done while he was probably a student at Grand Central, or shortly thereafter. The image on the right, on the back, he's noted it was a sample drawing, so it may have been one that he was showing to prospective clients or publishers. It, it may just been one that was a practice. Um, I've yet to determine exactly how much time he spent in art school, but just looking at the, pro project, uh, the way his career progressed, I think he was probably in school until about the mid to end of 1930. <coughs> so he was trying to get work uh, as he was a student, and his first <coughs> attempts to sell to major magazines like the Saturday Evening Post and Collier's uh, were met basically with rejection. Um, so a friend suggested that he try the pulps. Now at this time, in the 30s, um, the magazine market was dominated by the pulps and the slicks. So the pulps, like many of you know, were printed on cheap paper. They didn't cost a lot. <laughs> Primarily were, were, you know, stories, detective stories, murder stories, um, all kinds of crazy, sometimes lewd and tawdry stuff. And then the slicks were your higher quality magazines. They were printed on glossy paper, thus the slicks usually had a higher production quality in the art and also in the stories that they uh, included. Another differentiation in the hierarchy that John indicated in his archives was advertising. And that seemed to be even a, a higher level to go for illustrators. We'd have the pulps, you'd have the slicks, and then everybody wanted to get into advertising because there was more money there and also supposedly more sophisticated art directors to work with. So eventually, after schlepping around to the pulps for a while, he was met with success. And this is the first cover that he sold. He sold it to Street and Smith, which were major publishers of pulps. And he sold this in 1931. And after that, he produced about one cover a month for this publisher. Um, honestly, this is not his best work. This is pretty crude. Uh, in my opinion, it looks like the guy's head is not attached well and may fall off at any time. Uh, <laughs> And his hand is way too big. But you know, this is early on. He's a young man. And, and as his career progressed and he got older, his art obviously got better and he matured. Here's a few more covers that he did. You can already see that some of these are better than the first ones. Uh, his early works featured a much uh, softer brush stroke than most of his later work. And many of the elements in the scene are suggestions as opposed to details. You can see that in the Western story with the bush. Um, it's not very well detailed, and then the Wild West, Storm King, there's just sort of a, a suggestion of a doorway. Um, you'll notice in his later work in the 50s, which you'll also see, he has a sharper, crisper uh, style, and there's a m much more detail in the background. You know, it's not a criticism. This isn't worse than his later work. It's just an observation. And he's partially keeping in tune with the styles of illustration as he was working. And his career was changing over the decades. And you know, as everybody does, he matures and changes as an artist throughout time. I also wanted to point out with the red arrow that John noted on the Storm King issue that it was his last pulp cover. And that was August of 1932. I also wanted to show he did, that he didn't only do Western covers. I love these detective covers, especially the ones on the right. We've, I've blogged about them before, so if you want to check out our blog on NebraskaHistory.org, I have a few of them up there. There's a few more up in the exhibit. They're just bright and bold and crazy and scary, and I think they're fabulous. Um, the Black Aces cover is, is fun, too. It seems a little more... Um, artistic, but again, the, the hands are huge on these guys. I'm not sure <laughs> what was going on. And the one guy's arm is completely out of, out of proportion. But early in his career, he's figuring things out. So. 
So as his career began to kind of take off, uh, his personal life did too. In 1932, he married Maggie Huggins, who was a sister of his college friend. They moved together to a building full of artists with lots of studio space at 560 Main Street in New Rochelle, New York. Maggie ended up being a frequent model for her husband and also for the other artists in the building. And this is a, a, pet, a portrait that John did of Maggie in 1933. This photo from our collection, I suspect, is, uh, it wasn't identified, unfortunately, but I suspect is interior of the studio space at 560 Main in New Rochelle. Don't know who the guy is sitting there smoking, but you'll notice the painting on the wall is actually this painting from our collection. Um, and it's from the first story series that Falter illustrated. So this was you know, several, several stories in several different magazine issues. And it was called White Caps. And it ran in Home Magazine in 1932. Here's a few fun pieces that are from, actually were actually done by his mates at 560 Main. The, there's a, one up top is a portrait of Falter by Ch illustrator Charles LaSalle. And the bottom one is a drawing by illustrator George Bream, which is inscribed to Falter. They both worked out of 560 Main, and actually John got into the building in New Rochelle when he subletted Bream's studio space as Bream would leave New York City in the summertime. Falter enjoyed the camaraderie and uh, hijinks of 560 Main for about two years before he moved to a larger studio also in New Rochelle. So I said earlier, wife Maggie um, posed for a lot of his early work. Um, the, these are two images of Maggie from that period, the 560 Main probably period. She's indicated in a letter also in her archives that she commonly posed for all the people in a scene, male or female. Part of the reason for this is as they were starting out during the Depression, they just didn't have enough money. The pulps didn't pay particularly well. They had to spend a decent amount of money on the props and various things that they needed, and hiring models could be expensive. So Maggie was put to good work. Here's two more of Maggie and some fellas posing up the top. The guy standing in the front, I haven't identified who that is, but he pops up quite frequently in various photos for scenes. So he was a frequent model or friend of John. And the one on the bottom, the guy on the bottom is actually John himself posing for some story. I haven't figured out which one it is yet. These might have been taken a little bit later than the 560 Main Street, but they're kind of cool to look at. So with marriage and the effects of, depression, of the depression hitting them, Falter felt he needed to move up in the illustration world to make more money and gain more exposure as an artist. He eventually was able to sell three oil paintings to McFadden Publications as the publisher of Liberty and some other family-oriented magazines. And he got in his foot in the, in the door doing story illustrations for these higher quality magazines. This is a, um, another painting in our collection. I have not been able to figure out what the story is yet that it was illustrating, uh, but it's a pretty nice piece. The printing process was limited in the 1930s, and full color reproductions, especially for interior story illustrations, were expensive and so therefore uncommon. Many of the story illustrations were done in tones of black and white with one color reproduction. Obviously, in this case, it's blue. Here's two more early story illustrations that he did. The top one was actually in McCall's in 1938. The one on the bottom is unidentified. So we'll figure that one out later. I find this very interesting, this circular painting. You know, when the magazine wanted an illustration that was circular, that's the way it was painted. And since I grew up in a world of uh, Photoshop and crop, I just sort of assumed you'd paint a square or a rectangular painting and they crop it out. Well, it didn't quite work that way. You'd paint a circular painting instead. There's a couple more. Green Woman. That's what I call her. She was in Cosmopolitan in 1936, and the bottom one was from a story called Tiger Milk in Cosmopolitan in 1941. Um, as you'll notice, for those of you who have been to the exhibit, you'll notice that none of the paintings in the exhibit look quite like this. When we were donated the contents of his studio, John had obviously unstretched his paintings, so the wooden stretchers were removed, and many of them had been folded or rolled up. That's not good for paintings, so it caused a lot of loss, which you can see, where's my pointer? At the bottom there. 
and then also a lot of creases. So I want to um, give a plug to get Kenneth Bay, who is here, Kenneth. And he is the paintings conservator at the Gerald R. Ford Conservation Center in Omaha. It's a, a part of our historical society. And he spent many hours painstakingly preserving or conserving and restoring these paintings. So I'd encourage you to remember what these look like and go up and look at the story illustrations in our exhibit. They're fabulous, and he's made them look as if they were brand new. So he's done an amazing job. And hopefully we'll get these to him sometime soon so he can do his great work on them as well. So in addition to illustrating stories, John also wanted to work in advertising. Uh, as I mentioned before, it offered more money, you got a little bit more exposure, and you could work with uh, more sophisticated art directors. And in 1934, he actually got an agent whom he stayed with for four years, and he began getting ad work. Here's a few, the Clever Wife Campbell series, uh, another one for Park Davis. Um, Packard, he did quite a few for Packard and also for Gulf Oil. And again, his, his uh, brush style here is a lot softer than his later work. These, uh, and I think this starts to show the transition. The arrow shirt ads uh, are kind of a real departure from the earlier stuff. They're crisper, their lines are cleaner, and there's a lot more detail in the foreground and in the background. Um, he did quite a few of these arrow shirt uh, ads during the time. So by the end of the 1930s, Falter's career had taken off. He was a highly successful story illustrator, and he was in many of the top magazines and getting regular ad work. Since he was doing pretty well, he and Maggie bought a farm in the Pennsylvania countryside, and here they are cavorting on their farm in the late 1930s, but they also maintained an apartment and a studio in Gramercy Park in New York. In 1940, he began what was, was one of his biggest, the biggest ad campaigns of his career. He worked on a huge campaign for Pall Mall cigarettes. The campaign emphasized the cigarette's new larger size, and as the country was readying itself for entry into World War II, he chose to place the figures and the scenes in military settings. The campaign was a huge success, and Pall Mall sales skyrocketed. The dizzying pace, however, took a real toll on his health. He had to do about one painting every 10 days. Uh, and he suffered a pretty big physical breakdown. The client refused to stop the campaign, however, and he was able to negotiate a 100% raise. His diaries do indicate that he did have to end the campaign eventually because of his health, and he took quite a while to recover from um, that period of his life. And here I wanted to show you, this is another example of his use of photos. Upper right, that's the farm in Pennsylvania. The woman in the car is Maggie. And the fellow with the cigarettes is actually the guy that I think was in the earlier photo. Um, and then here's the finished piece. So it's fairly similar, except he's really changed the face of the man. He's aged him quite a bit. He looks a little more dapper, I think, in the ad. And then, of course, the background is, is completely different. Falter, understandably, wanted to help in the war effort, and in 1943, he enlisted in the Navy and began doing publicity work out of an office in White Plains, New York. He produced over 300 posters for the Navy in addition to pamphlet, pamphlets and portraits before returning to civilian life in 1946. And like any good military man, Falter commuted to work on a tricycle with art under his arm. I actually really like this picture because I think it's a great reflection of John Falter's sense of humor. It's which becomes very clear when you're going through the collection and looking at his art and reading his archives. He had a real uh, love of life. I think he was a happy person who liked to have fun and play tricks. So I like to imagine him riding to work on a tricycle. Here are a few examples of the posters that he completed while working for the Navy. He indicated that he came up with his own concepts and even his own headlines while working for the <coughs> Navy, but of course had to get final approval from Washington for all of them. While he was serving, he also did some outside work to supplement his Navy income, which was not particularly high. One notable, um, or one notable series of work he did was for Look Magazine covers. This one uh, is Admiral Halsey, and there's the poster. And I'm not really sure which came first, if he did the portrait of Admiral Halsey for Look or had already done it for a poster, but either way, it was on both. 
He also illustrated a series of stories written by Paul Gallico for Esquire magazine that focused on historic wartime acts by U.S. military. This one is entitled The Commander's Last Dive, which is pretty poignant. Um, several, actually, of the original Esquire pieces are on exhibit upstairs. So his career as a cover artist for the Saturday Evening Post also began while he was in the Navy. Sometime, probably in late 1942, the Post's art director, Kenneth Stewart, visited Falter in his Gramercy Park studio. Falter knew Stewart already because he'd been illustrating stories for the Post, interior stories for the Post, since 1936. During that visit, Stewart purchased this painting, a view from Falter's Gramercy Park studio that was intended as a present for Maggie. And I wanted to point out a couple things. Falter commonly included the people and places he knew in his paintings, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. This guy here is Jack Smart. He was an, an actor, uh, a relatively successful actor of the time, friend of Falter's. He shows up in a couple paintings, including another post cover where he's ogling a girl at a, at a luncheonette. And then this is actually Maggie. Now, that wasn't their house, but he drew Maggie in there watering flowers. This turned out to be the first cover painting that Falter sold to the Post, but not the first published. Stewart held on to it for a while, and before this one was published in March of 1944, Falter had already produced three other covers, including one of Benjamin Franklin, which was his first, in 1943. One thing you may have noticed, as I talked about, and as you'll definitely notice as we get into the post years, is that he used people and places that were very familiar to him. Uh, the people in many of his paintings look very real because they were. They come in all shapes and sizes and ages. And I think this gives his paintings a bit more emotional depth and makes them a little more relatable to everyday folks, um, a little bit more than some, maybe some of the other illustrators that were working in the day. Additionally, Falter was just a fine painter. He had a good design sense and a good sense of what, in his everyday life, would translate into an engaging painting. Uh, by and large, he avoided sight gags and looked instead for what might be humorous or uh, uplifting in his own and therefore in others' day-to-day -day lives. I like this about his work. Uh, I also like the fact that his post covers are often pulled back scenes, whether it was a city or the suburbs or the country, and he lived in all of them in his life. And they showed a lot of the surroundings and varied activities that were taking place in these places. And I think it makes for an image that can really hold your attention because you try to ferret out all the different little bits of information, all the interactions that are going on in his paintings. So this is a good example of Falter using people and places and situations that are familiar to him. He explains the inspiration of this uh, March 1946 cover in the excerpt, which I'll read for those of us watching on TV and can't read it. Doing a March Post cover now of a spring house cleaning. Among the points of interest is a guy taking down storm windows from the second story in a high wind. This was a letter to his father, if I didn't mention that already. This idea was prompted from my memory of you and me taking down that huge window by the upper stair, stair landing, 2402 Chase, Fall City. As I recall, it was always a major operation fraught with danger and tense nerves, and always considered the winter truly passed when that big devil was safe on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine that, that that's his dad and him trying to get that thing to the ground in Fall City. I have to say also, John Falter was a really good writer, so reading his letters is really quite fun. So, of course, he went back to his childhood in a place very familiar to him with this painting of Fall City, Nebraska at Christmas for the December 1946 cover. And the original for this is also upstairs in the exhibit. Um, this, is, this is a photo that we came across of him posing in his, in his studio with a half-finished version of the painting. And another document from the collection that I read um, has a nice quote about this, so I'll read it to you. Having walked every foot of this street a thousand times and having known every storefront and owner, it was quite natural for me to want to put the old street on canvas. I went to Fall City the summer of 1946 and made a lot of sketches and photos of the street from all angles, tops of buildings, out of windows, etc. I then came back to my then Bucks County, Pennsylvania studio, worked out my viewpoint, and set the mood as a Christmas scene. From then on, the picture painted itself as my imagination went to work, and I painted both sides of the street and then some. To indicate my dad's store, lower left, well, it's, you'll see in the next one, uh, 
In the lower left, I used his brother's middle name, Weber, on the sign. The war had only ended a few months before, so the GI Green Jeep war surplus was appropriate with the Christmas tree on top. I remember the best chili at Brown's Cafe, the high school rings at Davies, the Weaver Hotel, now the Stevenson, where our band played some dances, the Rivoli, where I played on the stage with Don's Six in Line, a non-rock group, the standpipe, no longer standing, that we used to sleep on on hot nights on the walk. It was a two-way street then. I remember it well. It hasn't changed much, which is all for its favor in these days. So these are a few of the preliminary photos, and he took a lot uh, for the Fall City cover. So different angles. In a Newsweek article, it was said that Falter uses a camera to record architectural details and the passing flavor of particular street scenes. File photos taken at different times of day and in different seasons remind him of how people act and what they wear at those times. So this is obviously the case with this painting. And then here's one that features Falter store. The Fall City Water Tower, which he supposedly slept on, pops up in Fall City Christmas and in these two other post covers. The one on the right is called Lover's Lane, Fall City, and the original for this is upstairs in the exhibit. Um, Falter was quoted in one article as saying that the view from above, the view from the water tower, may have influenced his perspective as an artist, since many of his, of his scenes have that pulled back, bird's eye view type look. And there's the, the, uh, the water tower again. And I was talking to John Falter's niece, which is the easy uh, way to put it, and she's here too, so you might want to talk to her afterwards. Um, and this is what your grandfather's house? Wasn't this? And the red brick one on the left. The red brick one on the left. Looking north in the neighbor's house where the lady's standing on that porch. But our garage was in that closed, and I don't think any kids ever got outside. Yeah. <laughs> So he'd take bits, bits and pieces of his life and put it in there, yeah. Then make it a little more interesting, right? Okay, so being that Falter came from a family of clothiers, and he tended to paint when he knew, and uh, it's not terribly surprising that clothing and clothing retail made its way into his paintings as well. The post cover on this slide features, I think, his father, George. It may have been an uncle, but I think... I think it's his father, George, selling ties at a department store at Christmas time, and I'm pretty sure the woman uh, on the bottom right is his wife, Maggie. And he also designed a series of ties called Originals in the, in the early 1940s. We have one of the Originals ties in the exhibit. These are a few more that we just obtained for the collection. And this is another example of, of John's um, sense of humor, because you'd put the ties on, and you'd close your jacket, and the top just looked like sort of an abstract design, but then you'd open it up, and it'd be spaghetti, or a lawnmower, or <laughs> some kind of goofy thing, and uh, I, think, I think they're really fun. The other neat thing we have in the exhibit upstairs are all the preliminary sketches that he did for the ties, so you can see those. What's that? Oh, wow. Okay. We'll go fast. Here's another indication of him painting what he knows. The park scene on the right is Gramercy Park in New York. Um, and I'm showing the one next to it because of the building. I think that the building that's being moved out of is maybe the Gramercy Park building here made somewhat smaller. So I suspect it was a building that Falter looked at frequently from his studio, probably liked, and it made an impression on him, and he used it more than once. And as I noted at the beginning, jazz and playing jazz was a passion of Falter's from his early, early years. Uh, music also made its way into several of his post covers. And in this case, John uh, inserted himself, aged a little bit, as the father interrupting the, the teenager's session. And then this is just a picture of John uh, playing the clarinet in 1960. <coughs> So at the pinnacle of his career at the Post in the 1950s, he was making about $2,500 an image for a Saturday Evening Post cover, which is about $20,000 today in, in, in our terms. Um, he was also considered one of the beauty artists of the Post. And so I'll read this quote to you from Ken Stewart, who was the art editor. You ought to run a few more like the covered bridge, too. We're short on those right at the moment. I have a few climbers. Climber, John Clymer was also a, a cover illustrator who focused mainly on landscape scenes. But after all, you're vice president in charge of the beauty department. If we don't have a little of that art stuff, 
will end up with too many gangs, gags. I don't mean to imply that the situation picture should be tossed over, but every once in a while, something like the covered bridge is really needed. So he's talking about that cover there. And I think this is really a testament to John's um, you know, artistic ability, that he's considered the beauty man at the post. So the amount of money that he received for post covers was actually relatively small compared to what he could make in advertising work. Advertising clients typically paid several thousand dollars more than most than the post, and in some cases, quite a bit more. A bit more. He did a series of four General Motor uh, uh, annual report covers in the 1950s, and he received $7,500 for each of these, which is about $60,000 today. Um, I theorize that it may have been the Post was able to pay less to their cover artists because of the fame that they gained and that their ability with that fame to negotiate more and more and more lucrative advertising work. Um, but for select Post covers like John, it was, the Post was considered a steady source of income, something that they could depend on compared to the hit or miss nature of uh, advertising work. So we talked about models and props. In addition to obviously using models and props for his paintings, he did extensive preliminary sketches, and our collection is filled with many, many, many of these. Sometimes he'd sketch out the whole scene, and sometimes just bits, in order to get the finished work to look just as he and then also his client desired. And these are just a few of the preliminary sketches for their, this 1947 cover. From what I've read and been told and seen in the collection, he was constantly drawing. I think he probably was doodling, sketching, no matter where he was. And many of his post covers were actually approved on the basis of a rudimentary sketch and just some explanatory text about what the finished painting would convey and what it would look like. And there are a few examples of this also up in the exhibit. So in the mid-1950s, John and Maggie divorced, um, and John remarried a woman with three young children. And Falter and his new wife, Mary Elizabeth, added to their family, and they had a daughter, Suzanne. So Falter had a new set of models, and his post covers began to reflect his new life as a family man. And so here's one, and these are his stepchildren put to good use acting out uh, the, the different scenes in this, this cover here. So as it is indicated by his appearance on the cover of Newsweek in 1952, Falter was considered, you know, about as good as you can get. He was a golden boy in illustration, and his work was well received by his clients and by the public. And I'd like to mention a couple of things about this cover. This is the preliminary sketch in our collection that he did. It's funny because it was for Newsweek, but you can see at the bottom he's still talking to Ken, who was with the, the Saturday Evening Post, sort of getting his approval for his idea. But what I like about this, and um, I, think it, I think it represents John's connection to Nebraska and his upbringing. He had to live in other places. You know, as, a, as an illustrator, he needed to be able to get canvas to client. We can't, e he couldn't email things. He couldn't, you know, send digital files. The canvas had to be delivered. He needed to be on the coast. So he was. But he never forgot where he came from. And here, you know, the pinnacle of his career is on the cover of Newsweek, and he decides he's going to paint himself with the family home in Plattsmouth and the Falls City water tower. <laughs> what I also want to mention, Falls City, again, um, is that fortunately for Nebraska, the Falls City Library and Art Center Gallery has recently acquired the original painting for this Newsweek cover. So if you're in Falls City, I would strongly encourage you to stop by and take a look. It's pretty impressive. So, in the exhibit upstairs, I didn't talk about any of the trouble John got in, so we're going to do that now, because it's kind of fun. Um, even though he was, you know, highly regarded, well-liked, uh, everybody loved him, did a lot of great work, he got into a pickle every now and then. Um, sometimes these problems were of his doing. Sometimes I think his ornery sense of humor got the best of him. This one, uh, you might have been reading a little bit. But okay, so this is for the Schlitz beer ad campaign, and obviously there's a couple, and they're in a modern art gallery or museum, and apparently the guy could not understand any of the art except for the big painting of beer. Uh, so this ran in a magazine, and in uh, in late 1952, Young and Rubicam, which was the advertising agency that 
John was working with for this campaign got a letter from Jackson Pollock's lawyer. Uh, let me see, my thing's not working. So here would be the supposed Pollock. Um, he, the, the artist was quite upset that his painting was reproduced in this ad and being ridiculed. So uh, we do have a copy right down here. It was from the Young and Rubicam office to John, basically um, asking John to explain whether or not that was an actual reproduction of a Pollock or just sort of imitating it, um, and that they presume that this particular painting are just takeoffs or adaptations. Unfortunately, I don't know what came of this, but I, I, I suspect it was handled and nothing much more. Okay, so he also got in trouble with farmers, for whatever reason. Um, he seemed to run into problems whenever he tried to paint farms. The quote above is from Stuart, and it's from a letter that is actually giving him the go-ahead to paint the farm, the barn, this scene here. So the letter is saying, hey, that's a great idea. Why don't you go ahead and paint that one? Um, but he references an issue that came up with this cover. It says, the one I like best is the barn fire. Just you don't go haywire on plowing. I'm sending a book a reader sent us after the catfish cover. If you do have a plowed field in it, you'd better have the county agent give it a look. <laughs> so then, <laughs> this bottom one, there was a, another quote that I found in the archives from John, which I thought was really funny, is the surest way of getting mail is to make a mistake, of course. I showed wheat being cut the wrong way once, and a lot of farmers wrote in about it. Farmers are always writing in. Anybody that paints a farm is sticking his neck out. <laughs> so I'm not entirely sure what he did wrong in this painting. Maybe if you have some of you are farmers, you can come tell me afterwards. But uh, he did continue to paint farms, so I guess he, he decided. He does have a lot. There's a lot of fan letters in his collection. I actually, uh, in getting ready for the exhibit, was not able to go through all of them because there's just, there's just so many. But he got quite a bit of, of fan mail. <coughs> All right, so this may have been his biggest faux pas at the post. The letter at the top is from Ken and obviously shows displeasure. Good God, Falter, what the hell's going on here? I don't know, it's kittens. I'm not really sure what would upset you about that. And then, and then uh, okay, well, I'll tell you what's going on here. So, red arrow, this painting here, this print here, does that, have any of you seen it? It's a gag print, okay? So when you look at it, it's just a guy in profile with a beard. But when you really look at it, his face is a naked lady. So apparently someone sent the print into the post. So, so John wrote a letter to Ken. Dear Ken, here is my written assurance that there is no such nonsense as the January 8th cover in any of the four covers you have on hand or that it will ever happen again. I truthfully feel very badly about the whole episode. I used very bad judgment and hope to be able to make amends by doing a better job all the way around for you. Thanks for giving me the chance to pick up the threads and continue, as ever, John. What I find additionally interesting and kind of funny about this whole situation is that we have three or four unfinished drafts of the final letter that John sent to Ken, and in one he was similar, similarly apologetic but laid it on real thick. Another one was actually written by his wife at the time, and the other, in the other one, he feigns complete innocence. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's just a man. But I guess he decided that that wouldn't work too well. So the, this short and sweet note worked fine. And uh, before too long, the correspondence between John and Ken is back to its normal, friendly, you know, camaraderie kind of banter. So the artistic zenith of Falter's career at the Post was probably the series of gatefold covers, which meant they opened up to be twice as large as a normal cover, depicting six U.S. cities. Featured here are the covers, not unfolded unfortunately, of Kansas City, Boston, New York, and Newcastle, Delaware. These were large undertakings for Falter, and he spent much longer working on these than he did for a normal cover, which he normally did in about 10 to 15 days. These were published in the early 1960s, and so they also sort of marked the beginning of the end of Falter's career for the Saturday Evening Post. Falter's, this is, this is John in his later years. 
Falter's relationship with the Post effectively ended in 1962 because for many reasons the Post went into decline about that time and its readership and advertising revenue dropped. The magazine increasingly relied on photographs for its covers and the work of the illustrator was needed less and less. A similar situation was taking place in advertising with illustrations increasingly being replaced with photographs and illustrators of the day had to look elsewhere for regular work. Fortunately, Falter was able to continue in book illustration and in fine art, and also in a little bit of advertising, until his death in 1982 at the age of 72. During his career, though, his work for magazines and advertising helped form the public's taste during a time when advertising and the media uh, and the influence of these on American culture was on the rise. He also, through his post covers, contributed to the lasting visual legacy of America, or of what America looked like in an idealized fashion through the 19, from the 1930s through the 1950s. So again, John Falter's career continued on past the post. The exhibit upstairs ends at the post partially because of uh, space limitations and partially because his work after his years at the post is really a lot different than what he was doing then and hopefully maybe someday we'll be able to get some of that art out and do another exhibit on Falter's later years. But that's all I have. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. I yes. just want to say I hope people will visit the exhibit. Deb did a terrific job with it, and like she said, there were so many pieces we had no idea that were donated to the museum <clears throat> back then. And she's, she's done a, a great job. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And thanks to the museum for doing it, too. You bet. It's our pleasure. We'd like to get John Falter out there to the rest of the world. Any other questions? Well, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>